Hey, guys, welcome back to another episode of The Daily Decision. I'm your host, Michael Chabot. Today's guest is one that is very near and dear to my heart, Mr. Nick Newmont. Nick is a certified clinical hypnotherapist based in Agora Hills, California. People who know him see him as an ordinary guy who is grounded into everyday activities. He's a father of three daughters, married to his wife, Audrey, whom he dreamed in vivid detail three months before he met her. He coaches girls softball and has fun inventing unique martinis. I love it. The question asked of Nick more frequently than ever is, what is my life's purpose? And I think we all look for that. Helping people find true happiness in his life is his life's purpose. He has been working as a metaphysical practitioner and hypnotherapist since 1992. He focuses his attention on empowerment. He says, my job is giving people their life back. He helps people know themselves better than others know them. Nick went through his own metamorphosis on his path to happiness. The early 1990s brought many changes, career, relationships, and moves. We must let go of the past and our pseudo comfort levels to realize our full potential and purpose, he says. Sometimes we need a good dose of courage. Nick has helped many people recover from alcohol and drug addiction. He enjoys working with young athletes and helping them overcome performance anxiety. Nick feels the most fulfilled when he helps his clients attain their goals and achieve success. While many motivational experts and life coaches tout about being goal-oriented, Nick's focus and aim is getting individuals to be result-oriented. The attention is on achieving by intention. I love that. Nick made his dreams come true, loves to help others do the same, and most importantly, be happy. Nick and his wife, Audrey, own and operate the Newmont Center for Balanced Living in Agora Hills, California multi-modality healing institution. Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. It's good to yeah, be with you. This is going to be fun. And there's so many great yeah. things just right in that bio, right? I mean, I think that was the yeah, show. Yeah, we're right done. There. Let's go. Um, let's go make some martinis. Um, <laughs> there we go. At, at uh, whatever time of the day people are Yeah. So, this. all right. So before we get into the, the meat and potatoes, all right, you like inventing unique martinis. Right. Just give me one example. Oh, one, one that's really fun is called the pink lemonade martini. And, and it's really, uh, and, and you have to remember, there's only one true martini and that's really vodka or gin with vermouth and an olive or an onion, and then there is the dirty martini. And in fact, I'm going to change it a little bit. Those are anything else that's fruity and all that are really called, really called martini Got cocktails. It. All right. So any purists are watching, and the people are watching this going, I thought this guy was a metaphysical guy, and he's works with drug and alcohol recovery, and he's talking <laughs> about martinis. It's it, it's a fun thing. Okay, it's not a habitual thing. So. The, if you take the essences of a dirty martini, which is really, you know, vodka, olive juice, and a blue cheese stuffed olive, and put in a dash of what's in a Bloody Mary, which is just a little splash of tomato, and then a little, just a dash, otherwise it ruins the drink, of mm. Worcestershire, that becomes a Muddy Mary, okay? Love it. Because you, you have the... Uh, one time I put in a dirty martini, a splash of Worcestershire, and then instead of being a dirty martini, it became mm. a muddy martini. And so there we have the, the muddy I mirror. And it's, it, it, and it is a great, um, with dinner drink or a brunch kind of drink. Anyway, but there, there's a whole bunch of them that I've created and made and sometimes I've invented them for people when we've entertained at our house. I and, think, and it's fun. I think we're going to have to do just a whole separate episode on, on Nick the mixologist, right? Yep. Yep. And I and I have fun with that. And I've I've never never tended bar publicly, but my dad back in Pennsylvania did have a night job that he loved at a relative's lounge, restaurant and lounge, where he tended bar. And my dad was one heck of a mixologist. And he knew exactly like just the way good chefs say only that much rosemary or that much oregano. My dad knew exactly how much and he never studied and and if i guess there's certain things that are in your genes yeah. that's one of it i i know how to do that stuff but we you know i i'm a, i'm a foodie i am all that and you, i've told you before michael that i've got relatives back east that several restaurants and stuff like that so it, it's yeah. in the blood yeah. so to speak 
And and when it comes to how I what I do in in my regular work, and I've told people this because I've done a lot of media through the years, national shows, and I said, look, I'm. I do that. I, I am a husband, a father. I vent martinis. I coach high school softball. So I am a real guy. So I'm not a toga sandal wearing granola eater. That's not, I'm not the Dalai Lama. So don't expect that. Now that doesn't mean I'm out there cursing at people and stuff like that. It's, you know, it, but it's like, I'm real. What you see is what you get. And I happen to have talents and gifts that that is, you know, what I do and I love what I do. It's how I make my living. Well, and I think what I should say to my listeners is, so I personally work with Nick and I invited him to come on the show. He's been helping me as those of you listening know that, you know, I went through a major tragedy of losing my daughter and, you know, like everybody else in the yeah. world, I have things from my past and my childhood and, and Nick is helping me work through it. And he's such an amazing, talented guy. And I'm not saying that because he's on this call, it's just reality. And so, I wanted him on this to share with all of my listeners, you know, the power of what he does. So let's kind of get into it a little bit. Um, sure. You know, everybody talks about, and, and you say this in your bio, Nick, you know, finding my life's purpose or even my life's passion. Like we hear all these self-help gurus mm -hmm. talk about like, find what you're passionate about. Right. And that's right. I know that's something that I've always aspired to do. And I've heard people say, let talk about that a little bit more. Like, how do you find your life's purpose? Well, it, it's the word passion can mislead people a little bit because it's that passion is like, oh my God, I've got to have it. I've got to do that. And that can throw people off. So when people go through midlife changes and I've been there that, uh, job isn't what they thought it was. Maybe people get fired or whatever. I've asked people many times, especially let's say the over mm -hmm. 40 crowd, you know, well, what do you like? And most of the time, the response that I get is, I don't know what I want to do. And you can actually see the anger and the frustration. That's why I do it like that. And I said, wait, 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 wait. I didn't ask you what you want to do or how you're going to make your money. I simply asked you, what do you like? What do you mean? In other words, if you like food, go up in a restaurant. If you like flowers, go up in a flower shop. That's what I mean. And a lot of times people have hobbies that they really like, but they just haven't put it together as to how, you know, they can make a living at that. And not the road everybody would take, but if you look at the last 30 years that you know, if you go back in time, back when you were a kid, why I was a kid, and people would play Pong or Space Invaders, nobody ever dreamed that you could make money in, in gaming as a gaming company. I mean, all of that yeah. genre, you know, from start to finish. So sometimes, sometimes we have to get judgment out of the way instead of thinking about, well, I could never do that. I don't know. Or the other thing that comes into play, and this is where hypnotherapy, you know, the, like the first session of hypnotherapy is, and that those banks of questions that I ask people that are based upon their conditioning. And sometimes it's conditioned in there by the mother and or father that this is the way it is and life is hard and on all those things that get conditioned, the first 15 years of our lives, our parents write our subconscious mm. script. Now, fortunately, with hypnotherapy, we can rewrite the script. So when people think they're screwed, you know, because my mother said this, or it could be a family of a generational occupation, all the way back to great grandfather was a doctor or a lawyer. Well, you're going to be that too. And you're going to take over the family practice. And it's like you, you hit generations at times that go, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like that. And it, not necessarily being rebellious. It's just not innate in them to go after that kind of occupation. So when you ask about, you know, what people's passion is, it simply has to be identified by aspects of life that they're drawn to that could be a hobby, or they simply just really like it, enjoy it. You know, then you can take that forward from there of getting into the word passion. And sometimes, sometimes when you look at people, 
and, and you ask them questions about what they want, because I was recently working with a, a longtime female client who is not in a relationship and hasn't been in a long time. And she was telling me that she wants to have a relationship. And I watch her voice level drop and her eyes drop. And I said to her, I said, I hear you. I said, but when you're talking about all the other things you do, I can see this energy and emotion behind it. When you talk about relationship, your energy comes way down. So it's, it's a matter of, is, do you, are you sure you really mm. want that? And is you that, know? is that because programming? I, is that, you know, where you see that energy change in somebody, is that like a light bulb for you and say, mm, yes, that's programming. In, in that particular situation, her parents were not warm ah. and fuzzy and it wasn't. And, you know, and so that time between nine and 15 is when we take our relationship cues from the father. So in other words, if the father is warm and fuzzy and demonstrative to the kids or shows affection to the mother in front of the kids between ages nine and 15, you know, then they're going to grow up where relationship is more important. But if the father is more, you know, strict and stoic and doesn't show a lot, then the kids grow up very cautious and reserved about approaching relationship. And they actually take a more intellectual approach to relationship. So in other words, they think before they mm. feel. And relationship is very low on their totem pole of priorities. Mm. So, and that's why, you know, everybody that comes to me, they take those banks of, of questionnaires. So I know exactly what the percentile is on either side of that. So that immediately tells me what I'm yeah, working with. Those questions are great too, because they're really revealing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, one thing to always passing on credit, you know, here in California, I attended HMI, which is a nationally known um, Hypnosis Motivation Institute, and was started by John and Alex Kappas, who they deceased, oh my God, 10 years ago. In fact, for viewers outside of California may not know that, but John Kappas was Mr. Florence Henderson, and everybody knows mm -hmm. Mrs. Brady. And I used to see her at school, and I was lucky that I actually got to study with the Kappas brothers. And they, they were up in years, but I got all those teachings from the horse's wow. mouth. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. So that brings up a great question, because even in our personal workings, I don't know that I've ever asked you this question, which is, how did you get started in this? Because I know... We've talked about what you've done in the past. You know, you worked in sales and some things, but how did how did you find right. this? Did the universe guide you to it? Yes, and and it's it's a strange thing, you know. And I was just talking about this with um, someone this morning. You know, sometimes you have to allow yourself to bottom out, not just bottom out. Sometimes people resist bottoming out, and and then you're clinging to this pseudo. Lifeline. Sometimes you just have to let go. So back in my um, mid to late thirties, which seems like a, uh, a few forever years ago. ago. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I did go through a lot of changes, which were career and also uh, a divorce at that time. And it was one of those things where you'd look at yourself, wondering, okay, how many steps am I going to mm. fall down? And, it, and it's kind of like that feeling of looking at the stars going, what is this, you know? But I also started meeting a lot of people that were both spiritual and or psychic. And all of a sudden, these people came into my path. Now, there's an old saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And all these people came into my life. And I always had one eye on astrology back when I was a lot younger I was also always fascinated by it and, and, and curious about palmistry. And so as I'm meeting these people and they did different modalities, whether it was cards or channeling or whatever, those abilities in me started coming out. Now, here's, a, here's another part, Michael, which is really huge that, of course, you don't know. When I was a kid, these gifts that I had mm. were there. And my mother told me about it. My mother knew it. Now, on my mother's side of the family, they all had, and we're both Italians. <laughs> yeah. right? So there is that superstition that can come with yes. Italians, too. The evil eye and all this kind yes. of stuff. And <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> and so they were afraid of it. 
And so as, as I got older, I would do things that were obviously intuitive or precognitive. And my mother would look at that as like, you know, recognizing that I was knowing things. And then as I got into my teens and I played football, I was a defensive back. I would see things happen before they happened. And I would intercept passes, recover fumbles. I I saw stuff happening. And even and for me it was still that kind of what's going on here. Wow. All right. And and there were there were more things that happened as time went on. And then I went through a period where it was kind of shut off. And then when my life sort of broke down and began to blossom again, all those gifts came on. And so I got into studying. Um, the decade of the 90s for me was completely studying, and I mean formal studies of astrology, numerology, cards, channeling. There's the healing work that I do, that, which is a whole mm-hmm. different, that, that's a whole nother show in itself. And, and so I studied and studied and studied. And, uh, and in addition to my teachers, I bought books and read, and I just filled myself with information. And at the same time, as I got into the mid nineties and 92, I got my first certification in hypnotherapy. As I got into the mid nineties, my practice really began to blossom and it's just continued to go up and up and up to the point where it we have this incredible institution now with my wife and other practitioners that are here. So as a psychic, I've been told that I'm very accurate, but my frustration came in, you can't make people do something. Right. You, know, you can tell them what you see and, and what the outcome is going to be. And that's what led me to becoming a certified hypnotherapist because I wanted people to be able to achieve those things. And that's where empowering people, giving people their life back, you know, became my motto and my mantra. And so that's how all that developed. And I went to two different hypnosis schools, one down in Irvine, originally AIH, and then uh, HMI in 1996. So it's just, and once you get on a really good roll, that ladder, you just keep climbing. And it's another thing and another thing and another thing. And and it just keeps going. So, but I, yes, I do like helping people get their goals, attain, and ultimately, whatever it is, just be happy. Mm. Just genuinely mm. happy. As you, you look around right now, and I know there are circumstances, but there's a lot of people that aren't happy. And, and it's reflected in behavior or things that you see on the news and so on and so Man, forth. Man, there's so much to unpack here. Such great answers. And, and time is flying by, Nick. So I, right. there's so many things, but I think you just touched on some good ones. So let's break them down one at a time. I'll make a statement, then I'll ask you sure, a right. question, which is, you know, okay. I, I always tell my listeners, and they've heard me say this before, my daughter's passing is as large of a tragedy as it as it is. It was It was a a blessing also in a way because it was an awakening for me in that. And I, my question or my statement is I feel like so many adults walk around asleep at the wheel, unhappy with their jobs, unhappy in their relationships, just that feeling of unfulfillment, right. Or being unfulfilled, I think. And so you touched on it a bit there. I'd like to, to talk about that a little bit more. What do you think is necessary for maybe, us as a, as a whole, as a population, as a society, maybe to have more of an awakening and how do we do it? And then I want to touch on, you talked about goals and, you know, the difference between being a goal oriented person, results oriented, but let's tackle that first part first. Okay. Well, the first, first thing here at at our institution, the, the phraseology that we use a lot and the way you describe people is unconscious. Mm. In fact, my wife in her book, goes through this process of identifying, moving through that unconscious, unconscious to unconscious, conscious, conscious, unconscious, and then ultimately to conscious, Mm. conscious. And, and sometimes words of inspiration or spirituality become too lofty, you know? And when we talk about being conscious, that's having your eyes open and awake. That's not, that's not meditating or doing yoga eight hours a day, which that's nice. Um, it's good, 
but it's have your eyes open and right now because there's so much that's gone on that's let's just call it distasteful or it, mm-hmm. fear-based you know there's a phrase called cognitive dissonance and that's a very fancy term for putting one's head mm-hmm. in the sand and and people have to have the courage to get their head out of the sand and look at reality as it is so one people need to love themselves more okay there's got to be this self love but and to do that which is truly heartfelt in in part of the answer to your question is that people need to come into a place of gratitude mm. and that really opens the heart and that is truly an electromagnetic vibration in your heart it makes your heart thing and and what feels better to be in a place of gratitude and appreciation or to be angry all the time well that's a no brainer but when you're in a place of gratitude and appreciation and and this would be something you of all people Michael to mm-hmm. you know to own this and and you've done a really good job on yourself you know it's very easy to look at what we've lost or what we don't mm-hmm. have but when we can look at and and this is something for everybody on the planet we have to stop at times and look and see what we have you know because what we have is precious and we can't get more until we recognize what we have and that's huge and, and going into appreciation i mean there there are people who are out living on the streets that do have appreciation mm-hmm. for what they have you know and it doesn't matter if you're on the street living under a tent or you're living in a 30,000 square foot house there has to be appreciation for what Agreed. you have because that's what opens up the heart and that's what makes us attract what we really want to get that's by living in the present not living in the past not living in the future just being where we are in this moment great great answer and you hear so many people <clears throat> excuse me talk about gratitude and the power of it and i think before i ask my question is absolutely i mean for me myself i could spend every day looking at what i don't have but i look at it the other way and say you know I'm, I'm blessed. I have X, I have Y, I have Z. So my question is, why don't more people practice gratitude? Why are we, I feel like it's maybe generational that we look at what we lack instead of what we have. And what do you recommend as a good gratitude practice? Well, part of what goes on is we have developed, especially in this country, the way we go about obtaining things and, and and this gets into economics too where so much is available but it a lot of times it's available through credit not really owning whatever Correct. that is and so we've created a society of entitlement and and it, it is touting self-deserving look people deserve whatever they can create mm-hmm. in their life i do agree with that we have the power to manifest whatever it is but part of it is it's the mentality of entitlement that causes that and and it's not just little kids anymore it's it's starting to we're starting to look at that we're starting to see it mm-hmm. with adults too so that's taking care of that is the first order of the day and and getting back into not not life is hard that doesn't work either you know that's what you and I grew up with suck it up yes. get over it you know, your reward is you get to keep your job. Right. You know, hey, we don't want to go there anymore. You know, oh, you're lucky you got a roof right. over your head. You know, we, we know that. Okay. But, you know, increasing our powers to manifest from within, that's what's important. You know, we do have the ability to create, but we, we look to the outside too much and what's owed us or what we should have. Life's not mm. fair. You know, you, you, you see all these things going on now, and, and it's a lot of people that tout that kind of stuff. When you look at their life and go, how is their life not fair? Right. right. You know, I'm not talking about unfortunate people and unfortunate yeah. circumstances. So, so we, we've created, we're creating a complacency is what we're doing. 
well, so where, where I come in is then we have to get into motivation. Mm. You know, we have to look at what has taken place that's created that. And that gets complex because there's a whole process that's called a mm-hmm. timeline that we have people do and positive and negative, you know, emotional events. So we, that's how we help people work through it is to look at events that have led up sure. to this moment. So great answers, by the way, <clears throat> do you recommend a gratitude practice? Like you hear some people, they say, Hey, get up in the morning, write down 10 things you're grateful for. Yes. Is it best to do it in the morning at night? That that's done in the morning and I'll explain why in a second. So, because there is, as you know, there is a nighttime yes. journal that you're very yes. aware of, which is very successful, but yeah, a, a gratitude journal should be done first thing in the morning because that's the way we want to start our day. We want to start in a place of gratitude because otherwise, you know, there are people that will stub their toe, you know, on a piece of furniture, arr, you know, <laughs> Day's going to say, no, no, we don't want to go there. So when you write, I am truly grateful and appreciative for, and whatever that is, and then you write again, you do 10 things. I am truly grateful and appreciative for, and you write that first part with mm. each time. It's not just that part and then 10 things. You write the whole sentence. And, and I have found in doing that, I mean, one time I was sitting in my house, it was the day that the gardener came and and I'm sitting there doing the journal in the morning and I wrote, I am truly grateful and appreciative for the smell of fresh cut Mm. grass. You know, it's some of it is just really simple, mundane things that a lot of times we, we take for granted. It could be, you know, that first cup of coffee, you know, but then it is significant things too people in your life and, and things that have gone. And and sometimes it could be something that happened the day before. I'm grateful for X Mm. happening, you know, and that way we own that and it keeps us very present with the feeling and the more appreciative we are in the present, our heart flourishes, allowing us to create more. And I know you and I talked about this yesterday. Great answer, by the way. We talked about this yesterday, the heart and the energy that the heart has. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, there are actual charts that show because your your heart is the electromagnetic center of your body. And, and it's proven that if your heart isn't working right, then there's this artificial device that goes into some people called a mm-hmm. pacemaker. All right, because the electric the electric current isn't working enough to make the heart go. So your heart is this center that fires up the 50 trillion cells in your body. So when well, they've actually done measurements on people, so when you're in a place of anger, it it vibrates. Let's call it vibrates at 125 on the mm. heart scale, but when you're in a place of appreciation. It's at 800. So your heart is open and working better when you're in gratitude and appreciation. Wow. That's impressive. And these are all studies that can be researched. And, and when people go into, um, there is something, again, you can find online and my wife, you know, uses this in a different form in her book. Um, ANTS, A-N-T-S, automatic negative thoughts. And these are all, things that people do. There's 10 different ones that are categorized. Um, uh, cat- catastrophizing, uh, fortune telling, um, you know, I bet he must not like me. He didn't say hi uh. this morning. You know, these are all, and, and when we get into automatic negative thoughts, that pulls the heart energy mm. down. So that's a good transition. And by the way, I will, Nick, I will ask you to direct me after the show where maybe we can find a copy of the Heart Energy Scale and we'll put it in the show notes so people can check it out. Um, Sure. This is good stuff, but I think that transition too, because we're already halfway through the show and we haven't really talked about hypnotherapy, which is something that I I think is important. But first I want to talk about, and you you touched on this a little bit, which is the subconscious versus the conscious mind, right? And you just kind of alluded to it, which is, you know, people with these thoughts, that's our programming, right? 
It's tr- it truly yeah. is. Yes. And, and we are a product of our conditioning. So as we're, as we're growing and, you know, it, it alive as kids, you know, the subconscious is the bigger part of us. The subconscious does 88% of what we do on a daily basis because this is your, your body is considered the mouth of the subconscious. Modern memory is in there. Everything you've ever experienced in your life is stored in memory, except so much of it is trivial. You don't need to recall it. But with hypnotherapy, especially if I'm dealing with an event, a trauma, a court case, I can actually bring memory recall wow. back up for an event. And I've done that for That's court amazing. cases. Um, and then uh, the bottom of the subconscious is the fight flight mm-hmm. mechanism. And it's actually fight, flight, freeze. So when you're confronted with a circumstance that's challenging, you either run from it, attack it, or you're Mm -hmm. paralyzed. And then the other part of the subconscious that's important is the um, pain pleasure syndrome. That's not physical pain. That's mental pain, meaning unknown. So when you go to introduce a food to someone, especially a little kid, the first, "Mm, I don't Uh. like that. How do you know? You never tried it. I don't like that. How do you know? You never tried it. As adults, we face th- these unknowns. You could have a friend that's single and say, hey, we know someone great. We're going to fix you up on a blind date. Their eyes get this big. Uh-uh, no way. What, did you have a bad blind date? No. Well, why don't you want to do it? <laughs> no. Okay. Or, or telling someone, an adult, that you're going to take them to an amusement park in the, you know, roller coasters or loop-de-loop and 100 feet high. It's like, I'm not doing that. But here's the thing. When, if it's a good experience, it converts from pain to pleasure. But if it is a bad experience, then it's cemented in pain. And that person is never going to mm. do that again. And then the other thing is because your subconscious is so big, and that includes the automatic autonomic nervous system you know our subconscious does everything like if the lights flicker your pupils will dilate or close you can feel temperature changes in the room this is all done by the subconscious the subconscious can take in up to two million bits of information or message units at one time we're 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 like this big cpu that's just processing all this stuff all the time we're not even thinking about it we're just going along with our business. Now, on the other hand, the conscious mind only does roughly about 12% of what we do on a daily basis because this is logic, reasoning, desire, decisions, mm-hmm. willpower. And because the, the conscious is so, so much smaller, it can only take in two to maybe seven bits of information at once. And that's why we have been told for how many years now that when you drive the car, don't play with your phone, don't drink coffee, play with the radio or women putting on makeup. Mm-hmm. You know, don't do that because your focus can only divert and dilute a certain amount. And and that's why truly there are people that cannot walk and chew gum at the same time because they, they can't divert from what they're doing. So, and the, these are components that we you know, we need to know about and how people think and how they process in putting them sure. into hypnosis. And this is why we see people who self-sabotage, right? They may have these great opportunities in, in right. life and relationship in their job and they just self-sabotage and you hear them say, I don't know why everything I do, t-, you know, you hear these people, right? Everything I touch turns to, <laughs> right? Yep, exactly. Right. Why affirm right. that? Right. Why, why affirm that people see people tell the same old mm. story and I tell people and, and my wife does too. You have to start telling yeah. a new story, change your story. I love that. So this gets now into rolling up the sleeves because this gets into the meat and potatoes right. of hypnosis. Before we do that, there, there are different types, levels, certifications, right? So you, you really should do research before you choose a hypnotherapist, Correct. Truly, and it should be a certified hypnotherapist, a person with CHT after their name. And and let me say this, a hypnotist mm. is a category. A hypnotist is not a hypnotherapist. They're two different things. And a lot of times there are um, 
say, psychotherapists that know how to hypnotize, but they are not hypnotherapists. Mm. And when you are a certified hypnotherapist and you go to a, a major accredited school, as I did, the program that you're put through, look, truth be told, in the first four weeks, we learn how to hypnotize and all those deepening techniques and all that. The rest of it, which is over a year of several days a week, is all mm. psychology and understanding people on a much deeper level so that schools like that, that are that good and that big, it's like a mini PhD. Love it. You know, <laughs> coming out of there yeah. with that. So, so it, my wife and myself, we understand human behavior very deeply. And that what, that's what allows us to treat all these different anxiety, stress, psychoses, sure. addictions, you know? Yeah. And I think just for those that are listening, that maybe are, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, skeptical of it. Um, yeah. I, I love that when I first met you, Nick, and you said, don't worry, I'm not going to make you like bark like a dog or quack like a duck, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. Um, right. This stuff right. is real. Like I, after every session that I've had with Nick, I'm like, wow, like it really is in my opinion. And then I'll let you talk about it. It's in my experience, it's like a form of deep meditation, right? You're, it's not right. like you're asleep. It, your mind is still alert, but your body is just in this hypnotic state. It's just phenomenal. Right. Yeah. You let go. Well, th there's three. There's three stages of hypnosis. Stage one is when you hear me, but you're very alert as to what's going on, which usually happens in the first session. Second stage hypnosis is when you mm. drift in and out. Third stage hypnosis which I don't put people in very often is when I really just oh, knock wow. them out and I need them to get out of the way because of something mm. traumatic where I have to go into the subconscious and do the right reprogramming. And there are a lot of techniques for doing this and it's language that I don't usually share with clients because it, it would be like an attorney describing why they sign a certain of kind of contract. It's like, you don't need to know that. It's just that we know, what modality and what approach to work with people. Now, when it comes to, to hypnotherapy or hypnosis, mm -hmm. either way, there are people who are more difficult to hypnotize than others. And those are the people that are much more higher intellectual and uh, up in their mind, more a lot more yeah. left brain. They are more difficult to hypnotize, but as the saying goes, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> so those people may be tougher to get under, but when they're under, they are gone. Yeah. And I've actually heard people say, really, you know, wow. Yes. And, and what I would say to anybody listening, so Nick and I are in different States. And so we do everything virtually this way. And I can tell you that it's, right. it's in my opinion, it's every bit as effective as I was there in the room with him. Um, for me, I probably would have been one of those that would be difficult to hypnotize be if I hadn't have found meditation. I think meditation has helped right. me because I'm able to let go because I'm such a control freak or have been. And so, but enough about me. I want to get into, so we talked about, you know, hypnosis and hypnotherapy. Let's talk about once you're in there, what your goals are, what you're trying to do and how it helps people. Well, the first thing, the first rule is yeah. relax, okay? And and when you're talking about meditation, that's actually a good segue because the key to relaxation is breathing. Breathing is everything. And and I when I watch people, I can tell that the, the way they breathe isn't correctly or some people actually mm. hold their breath. So getting people to breathe properly is the first thing. And once we can get past that, then the body begins to relax. The body begins to send oxygen throughout itself, which is an automatic relaxer. So it, it's not the person having to be hyper aware of their breathing. It's just to activate the breathing and the rhythm of it so the body will naturally yeah. relax. That's the key. And, and when you use hypnotherapy, no matter what we're working on, one of the great byproducts of it is they are more naturally relaxed, but they also sleep better. I think I told you after our first session, it was the best sleep I had in years. 
Yeah, it takes the edge off. Yeah. It really does. Now, in, in today's world, most of what we work on is what, let's say, what people are presenting is some form of anxiety, whether it's a general anxiety disorder, performance anxiety, test anxiety. It, it, as you said earlier, you know, I do work with a lot of athletes that uh, get themselves too wired up. So relaxation is the key. And from that point, with what the presenting issues are, then we address those specific issues with hypnosis. And and as you know, there is a life history history questionnaire that people fill out. It's eight pages. And I read all that to see what events have taken place. There's I, I get into information about relationships with mother, father. What if one of the parents unfortunately exited mm. early via via dying or divorce? All this comes into play. All of it creates a yeah. reaction. And it, it, you, there's a lot of it that I don't like this phrase, but I'll use it. There's a lot of it is kind of textbook. When certain things happen, you know that the result is going to be some form sure. of this. But we can do a lot of reprogramming or reframing. And of course, the power of suggestion mm. is very high. People are suggestible. And by the way, the more anxiety written, ridden mm. a person is, the better candidate they are for hypnosis because they're up here so much that when you get them to relax, they come yeah. way down. It, it's such a relief. I'm laughing that. because I'm like, okay, it makes sense why I go so deep into hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if a person came in like really like – almost yeah. flatlined, they're not going to feel that much when they mm. go into hypnosis. When a person is more up here, they get the feeling of coming yeah. down and it makes, it makes yeah. it better. And, you know, for those of you listening, any, any skeptics, I can't name names, but I know some of Nick's patients personally, and they in their lives are flourishing. They're, they always have this you can see from Nick when you either listen to his voice or when you watch the video version of this, the energy that he brings, the energy that exudes from you, Nick. These people that I'm talking about that are clients of yours also, it's that same energy because they're doing the work, right? And I, sure. it's funny, I, I look at you as yes. like a surgeon who kind of goes in and finds that spot and then's like, okay, yeah, we don't need that. Let's take that out, right? That, that's bad. Let's get rid of that. That's been holding you back too long. Right, right, right. And I have said through the years – um, well, for, first of all, there are a lot of people that do use me as their primary um, primary mm. therapist, primary yeah. care, a, a, instead of going to a, a, a psychotherapist or mm -hmm. psychologist. Um, so I, I've said through the years, I get I most of the time I get the tough cases. Yeah. And when you describe me as a surgeon, yes, I, I'm not the the GP, although I can put a band aid over a, a cut. You know, I, I've, look, I've worked on, look, you've had mm -hmm. your own unfortunate circumstance, of course, and everybody can make a comment about what's worse, what's not. It's, it's, you know, of course. And, but I have worked on cases that you, you wouldn't want that mm -hmm. to happen to you. Um, 80% of my clients are women. So I deal a lot with that. And, and yes, in today's world, abuse, some form of abuse sure. runs rampant. It is true. And it's something that has been swept under the carpet, you know, for a long time and hidden. But, you know, there's something I, a phrase I coined over 20 years ago. You can only sweep so much dirt under the carpet before yeah. there's a lump. Oh, I like that. <clears throat> I like that. And just a quick statement, which is, you know, since my daughter's passing, I've worked on, you know, I've done a lot of talk therapy, right? Psychotherapy, whatever you want to call it. Sure. And I think there's, there's a need for it. There's a place for it. But what I really liked about working with you is like, look, we're going to go in and get to the root of the problem and help you right. reprogram the way you think or your brain or your, your, your subconscious. Right. Because. Right. Go ahead, please. <laughs> And and for people watching this, it is not a form of brainwashing. Mm. There is nothing that will happen that will cause you to forget your daughter. That that that's mm -hmm. not going to happen. But it's how you feel, you know, lessening the pain of it, 
that's what's what is what's the key. Um, yeah, and and people in hypnosis, by the way, because I know how people think. I don't take control. I don't take charge. Okay, it is not brainwashing. It's simply people tell me this is what's going on. This is what I want to work on. That's mm-hmm. what I do. Um, I, I don't lift up the hood and go, well, I know I'm only supposed to char- change the oil filter today, but I'm going to put a bigger carburetor in there. No. Yeah, no. and I can, I can attest that. to that. And I think what it's <laughs> – I was going to use an example is, you know, like in my family growing up, there's a lot of fear-based stuff. You know, don't do that because you might – right? And I think that might be an Italian thing too. But And, and yeah, and these are the that. things we're talking about <laughs> that you can go in and help – over time reprogram so that you're not living in so much fear, Truly. right? Yeah. Right. Let's... Yeah. And I has, as a kid, I had early, um, I, I didn't learn how to swim till I was mm. in ninth grade, you know, going into high school. So I had a fear of water and a fear mm. of dogs. All right. Came from my mother. Okay. Uh, nothing ever happened to me with a dog. Um, I never almost drowned or anything like that. And it is just yep. programming. Yep. And so you're so, in, in some ways, we're giving you a lot of titles today. You're also like a computer programmer, right? You're going into the hard drive <laughs> and getting that thing to run as right. smoothly and as efficiently as possible. Well, and what I do, if you think of, mm-hmm. put it that way, I take out yeah. the viruses. I, I'm your, I'm your mental antivirus <laughs> I love it. guy. So, I mean, there's, we could go for hours and of course we want to keep you, you know, keep respectful of your time. But a question that I've heard people ask before when it comes to hypnotherapy or is, is it a one-time thing or is it, does it take time and what should you expect the timeline to be? Okay. Depending on the circumstance, it is, it is going to be multiple sessions. Look, Rome wasn't right. built in a day. And when people are a certain age and they've been doing something for extended years, we can't go in with the snap of the finger yep. and get rid of that. And if we could do that, it would probably traumatize mm. the person. So the person has to make a commitment to a certain number of sessions. Now, someone asked me about how many sessions does it take to do whatever? I say legally I can't answer that because I don't know. And if I did give you a number, I could be misrepresenting Mm. myself. Okay. So when people sign up for something that seems to be within the norm, you know, and and we have packages. We have five-session packages, 10-session packages. So I I suggest a package, you know, and do it that way. Like, for instance – we do work with cigarette cessation. Oh. Well, that's inv- that's involved because if a person relates smoking to something else like drinking coffee or having a glass of wine, an association smoker takes longer. Um, that that can take a good eight sessions because you have to wean them off gradually uh, so they yeah. can let go. So every situation is different. Um, when it comes to for, um, grief, I definitely do not put a time frame on that because society deems for some reason that when something has happened a while back, well, you should be over <laughs> yeah. that by now. Well, people should all over themselves. <laughs> and the grief is, is a very personal thing and people get over it as they can when they do. And that's it. As people have to be able to wean, you know, off yes. of that and moving into their comfort yeah. level. So it's all different. Now, when I'm getting into very extreme things like, you know, molestations and stuff like that, and, and it's, and it can be yeah. generational that of takes course. some time. And, and, and there are hypnosis is designed to get in, work on the issue and get the person to mm. move on. Okay. But I've found that when I work with people and I keep building them, there are people that have been working with me for years because they love the sessions and they just blossom. Uh, so that's really fun. Sometimes people quit for a while. They, then they call and they come back. I need a couple more sessions to work on this mm. now. 
Um, you know, it, the funny thing is in any business, Michael, when you treat people right and give them good mm-hmm. results, you know what, then they're going to come back and they're going to refer you and results count, you know, goal oriented versus sure. result oriented. I'm goal oriented. I'm gonna result oriented. Yes. I did. Yes. I love that. And great answers. And while you were talking, I think I remember in one of our first conversations, you were talking about these things that happen in, in your life are kind of like deep grooves that are worn into your memory or into your brain, right? And I picture when exactly. you say that, I see, I don't know if you've ever visited Pompeii in Italy, but there are there are wagon tracks in stone that are like six inches deep. And you think, wow, think about mm-hmm. the friction and the pressure. And so I look at it in my mind as those grooves and it's like, well, those grooves – were worn in over years. You're not going to get them That's out right. in a day or two. That's it's right. going to take some time, but if it's consistent work, right. you can get rid of those grooves. Right. Right. And the idea, you said this earlier, I do go into the core yeah. of the cause. I don't work in layers like a traditional sure. psychotherapy. Okay. I'm not, I'm not peeling the onion. I, I, I do have to know what the recent behavior is. And when people write up their timeline, I can see going back in time. But if we can go after how a person was conditioned or something that happened early in life and work on that, it's amazing how all these other things just basically implode and collapse in on that. And it allows us to get the result that we need. And And it doesn't mean that we don't work on current of events course. either. Sometimes we have to do some reformatting in there. And it's also how the mind's eye see it. Um, years ago, uh, coaching with, uh, mm-hmm. little girls, like six, you, you know, one of the girls was, a, she's a really good ball player and catch any, she's playing first base, catch anything hit to her. But when the girls would throw the ball from the other infield positions in the dirt, she'd do this. And I went over to her and I said, Hey, it was, it was one minute. You're really good at at fielding ground balls, aren't you? And she's like, yes. I said, so when the girls throw the ball in the dirt, it's just another ground ball. Well, you could see the lights go on and it changed immediately because she saw it differently in her mind's eye. Um, some years ago, weeks after 9-11 occurred, I was working with a woman on a, on a regular basis. She was in her early 70s, and as many people, she was very shaken up. And so the first thing, and by the way, in when you're doing therapy, compassion and bedside manner sure. comes first. If you don't care, if you're having a bad day, don't go to work that day. Don't work with people because you have to care about what's going on with them. So this woman, I I just sat forward and I said, look, did you know someone? Did you lose someone in New York? And she says, no. I went, okay. I said, so close your eyes, look at your life before 9-11, bring yourself to the present. And when you're ready, open your eyes and tell me how your life has changed. It took her two minutes, Michael. And she opened her eyes and said, it hasn't. I said, that's right. And she went, thank you. I feel so much better. So, you know, sometimes it is 30, 40 minutes in hypnosis, and sometimes it's just two minutes of being, getting the person to reframe how they're seeing things. And, and yeah, I mean, so we're almost out of time and there's so much more to talk about. So, What I would say is, look, I'm a 100% believer. The hip- hypnotherapy is absolutely amazing. I'm seeing the differences in my life. And, you know, I just look forward to the continued progress that we're going to have together. So, yeah, you know, there's there's some other things that you do. And I want to talk about energetic he- energetic healing. And you also wrote a book on numerology. Yes. Here's the, here's the yeah, tease. Yeah, there it is. Who's that guy in the picture? <laughs> Yeah, the, the young guy with hair back in 2001. Yeah. <laughs> and it was darker, too. You're still looking good, my friend. Um, so Thank talk you. about what is numerology? It's the science of numbers as it pertains to man as a um, 
in, in the same way astrology is a language of how the planets interact. It's how the numbers from one to nine interact with each other. We believe it's a, a universal language that quantifies mm -hmm. everything because it, it doesn't matter. You could be here and say, you know, one donut. You could be in Mexico and say, right. No. You know, it's like, it's the same yeah. thing everywhere. All right. And so there are very simple second grade equations that allow us to quantify our birth date, our name, and it relates as not just a, a personality profile, but as a predictive science. And and I've used it predictively. And if you have if you have time, if we have time, Please. I can tell a great story as part of the tease. So, you know, years ago in back in the you know, before the book came out, back in the mid nineties, ninety six in there. I was part of a networking group, and this is back when the Dow Jones was 7,000, mm -hmm. okay? Remember remember back in the dark ages? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it was the stockbroker's turn to speak that night in the networking group, mm -hmm. and he said that um, he felt that, and this was, I think, late January, early okay. February, he felt that in May that the Dow Jones would eclipse 8,000 and the, uh, the New York stock exchange has a birth date, which is May 17th. And I went through my calculations as to what year it was and how to bring it from the year to the month to the day. And I made him a bet. And the bet was a margarita that if it's in May, he wins. But that year I said, I believe it will be July 16th to the day. I said, if it's not that, you win. It was. <laughs> On July 16th, I think it was 96, the Dow Jones hit 8,000. Wow. And it, of course, it's a matter of record. You can yeah. look that up. And so that's how powerful wow. it is. It, it I is think we're going to have to come so, back, have you back in a few few months and do a whole show on numerology. I think that would be a lot of fun. Love to. I do. Love to. This is yeah, good fun. Yeah, I mean, so – and and again, when I have you back, we'll talk more about it. But just give us a little snippet on what energetic healing is. Energetic healing is approaching the, let's call it the energetic body, the aura, the chakras, the Got energy it. center, centers, and how to access that through process, which that takes more time to explain, and going in and making adjustments to those energy centers which adjust how a person thinks, feels, inter how they interact with mm. other people. It's quite potent. It's referred to here as sentient. Sentient means conscious. Sentient healing. And it's something that um, we not only do here, but I teach on fundamental and very advanced levels. And there are things that I have actually innovated, techniques that you will not see anywhere else wow. on the Internet. So we, we pride ourselves here at the Newmont Center as being innovators of yeah. techniques. We, we don't copy. Yeah, and I love that because we all are basically energy, right? You can feel people's energy, right? right? Some of it's negative, positive, oh, yeah. right? That's right. And that's something that when your aura overlaps with someone else's aura, you create a new mm. vibration in there, okay? That part. And, and that is... The feeling, the gut feeling that you get is it's not the other person has bad energy. It's whether the two energies are compatible. Yeah. Okay. But the problem with human nature is our left brain get, gets us to think through things and we talk ourselves in or in and out of things that we should not talk ourselves in or out of. And down the road, we're going, oh my God, why didn't I trust mm. what I felt? Mm. So we have to trust when we're in a circumstance and it may not be right, we have to trust that. You know, if an, a small animal is out in the field somewhere and they sense a predator, they're not like in, in horror movies, oh, like, let's go see. <laughs> they run the other way. Humans, there is a component to human nature where we sometimes find out how mm. bad it can be. You know, I've, I've joked about this for years. When my kids were a lot younger, they pull something out of the refrigerator that had been in there maybe too long. They go, Dad, you better smell this. No, I don't need that <laughs> smell in my nose. 
If you think it's bad, then throw it away. But next time, finish it before right. it goes bad. Right. <laughs> Nick, this has been a lot of fun. Now, I, before before I let you go, just a couple things. Number one, you guys sure. do a show. Is it weekly? Yes. In fact, there's okay. two shows. Two shows weekly. Um, the show on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock Pacific okay. time is called Mainstream Metaphysics. And it's on okay. Facebook, Facebook Live. And, and if people are interested, you know, they can friend me, Nick Newmont, N E W O N T, on Facebook. And then on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock, and, that, and Tuesday night is done with my wife and myself or an, another guest. Thursday nights, my wife, Audrey, does conscious mind mm. tripping. And that's her, Audrey Newmont, on her Facebook Live page. And they are weekly. awesome. I'll make sure I put that in the show notes so people can go check it out. I've seen a few. They're awesome. Um, Thank it's, you. It's been a pleasure and honor. And like I said, got to have you back because I think we could do a whole show just on numerology. I think that would be a lot of fun. Numbers are fun. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Oh, I appreciate it's you. my pleasure. I mean, the, the world is a better place with you in it, buddy. And I love the work that you guys are doing thank you. to my listeners. I would say is, you know, thank you for listening. As always, to the show, The Daily Decision, I'm your host, Michael Chabot. If you liked it, if you found anything interesting, please share it, like it, tell your friends about it. And remember, it all starts with a decision.